When the pandemic hit, three main things happened to the telecoms networks. The pattern of data usage changed, the volume of data increased, and the most used application shifted towards interactive video and virtual. We need to take the lessons from the last few months and apply them now as this situation is likely to happen again and we need to be prepared. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content at Telecom TV. And joining me now are Kurt Delanger, who is Head of Transport and Data Networks at Proximus, Basil El Abed, Director of Transport Network Planning and IP Core at DO, and Raphael De Fermin, Senior VP IP Optics EMEA with Nokia. Welcome everybody, thank you very much for joining us. These past few months have been hugely challenging time for countries across the world, but the telecoms industry appears to have stood up very well. How have you managed your businesses and operations through the COVID crisis? Kurt, could I start by asking you and Proximus, please? Yes, for sure. So um, we saw indeed a tremendous increase of traffic after the first uh, lockdown uh, in the middle of, of March. Um, at that time, uh, we were busy with uh, the rollout of a new uh, IP backbone network. And um, uh, we did all what we can to reshuffle traffic from our legacy uh, platform to our next generation IP platform. Uh, in, and that resulted in, uh, in no congestion at all, uh, enabling abling to offer uh, all services as we did before the lockdown. Thank you. And, and Basil, how have you managed your businesses and operations in do through the COVID crisis? So, but our, during our COVID crisis, uh, the beginning of the, the first few days, we had to go through a lot of upgrades within the network to make sure we're uh, having, the, uh, having enough capacity uh, to sustain the influx of traffic that we were expecting. And uh, it did uh, rise quite a bit. Uh, we did various upgrades with the various OTT providers, uh, Microsoft being one of the biggest ones due to the online learning uh, in, in UAE. We did a lot of upgrades with, the, with Netflix for the, for the OTT content, and we also did a lot of upgrades with, with, uh, with Google. So these were some of the OTT providers. Uh, there was a lot of traffic that went on to, on to WebEx and, and virtual connections for the, all the meetings. So there were a lot of upgrades done across the core and the edge of the network. Thank you both. Now, given the experiences of the last nine months, what has changed in your network architecture strategy, particularly at the edge? What do you need to do now with edge network capacity across the network? Kurt? So uh, in the legacy uh, IP uh, backbone, we had a data, um, a central data edge, virtualized in each uh, edge router. Uh, which enable us to um, move very quickly uh, services from the old le legacy uh, platform to the new BNG in, in the edge. And with this, um, the resilience of our network, it's much higher because of if we had um, a central data edge, the number of impacted customers is quite huge. I will speak uh, about uh, 100,000 impacted customers. And now with the transformation to, to the edge, it's limited to the customers connected to the edge of central office. And Basel, has anything changed in your edge network architecture strategy? What, what do you need to do now with edge network capacity? Uh, so we're looking at distributing our services across the edge to limit the fall of domains as one of the, uh, one of the major uh, uh, plus points or positive points of, of, uh, of having services on the edges. Uh, so things like distributed BNGs, uh, we're looking at distributed uh, packet cores and in readiness of 5G also uh, to really limit our fault domains in case of, uh, of um, disasters or catastrophes that, uh, that happen. Uh, we're also looking at heavily distributing content on our edges uh, so customers get the content as fast as possible. So the byproduct of the pandemic was that uh, the customer experience really got elevated. Uh, and customers really demand uh, content being delivered to them as fast as possible. Raphael, how do you think the pandemic has changed the future of the telecoms industry? Do you think it will change the way that businesses view their communication services? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, to begin with, I work for Nokia IP uh, for quite a number of years. Uh, as you guys and, and, and many of our viewers will know, 
Uh, we're a major IP provider. We're, in fact, uh, the largest in the EMEA region. And still, a lot of people I know, some of my friends, think that I work for a company that makes mobile handsets. So we're, we're sort of taken for granted. We always were there. Telecommunications were there. They worked and nobody worried. We didn't seem that important. I think the first thing we just gained is our proper awareness. I mean, the sector is now crucial. Everybody working from home, everybody uh, getting their uh, 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 free time from home because, okay, you probably use more Netflix services and, and, and movie distributions, et cetera, because you cannot do much more. Now, all of a sudden, people have realized how important we are and how much at the core of the society we are and we will continue being. And of course, awareness is important on its own. And then secondly, I think it has changed also our own perception. Uh, now IP networks, we understand, need to be important, need to be resilient. Quality is crucial. They will be running hotter than we anticipated because we will get peaks like the ones we got over the first weeks of uh, COVID. So we better have the proper routers, the proper network, the proper protocols in place to sustain this kind of extra effort that we are going to be demanding from what we now everybody understands is uh, a very important asset for our society. Thank you. And Kurt, do you see a similar thing? Do you think that your customers have, have changed the way they view their communication services? And also, picking up on what Raphael just said, do you yourselves change your perception of your networks? Yeah, sure, we better can be prepared. Um, so we, we saw an, an, an important increase, uh, half of March. But we noticed also that it never went back to a, to a, to a lower uh, bandwidth. So it's it's increasing uh, all the time and over the last 10 days we, we saw uh, a, per a percentage increase of traffic every day so um yeah we, we we need to be able to absorb reroute and have all measures in place to anticipate uh, as soon as possible so we see uh, not only the enterprises but also schools um, hospitals are very demanding to have digitized solutions in place uh, in which we can anticipate very quick on um, on bandwidth demand, something we need to take into account to our future that we can automate uh, the demand for bandwidth, but in an orchestrated way using all uh, the, the capacity we have in as well as our optical as our IP network. Thank you. And Basil, do you see the same thing? Do you think that people have um, increased their the, the value they put on communication services. They're seeing communication services in a new light now. Uh, for sure. Um, like one of the colleagues mentioned that he works for Nokia and everyone thought they're just a handset manufacturer. Uh, the same thing was uh, was with the telecom provider. It's like, what do you guys do? And whenever you try to explain it, no one really got the, the idea. But uh, since the pandemic, everyone has realized the importance of, of, uh, of the telecom sector and uh, really being a pillar Within uh, within the country's infrastructure, and that was more emphasized during during the pandemic. Uh, not only providing customer uh, content uh, to customers or links to customers, but there was a major uh, demand from uh, uh, hospitals, like temporary hospitals that were set up all throughout the country for the testings or housing COVID patients. And uh, really, the, the telecom sector played a vital role in having uh, connections provided to these hospitals that were set up. So it has changed the outlook of, of uh, the, the sector and the employees within the sector. Kurt, do you think the lines between consumers and enterprises have blurred? Because we're seeing more people work from home now and using their, their homes as their places of work. And what have you learned about your customers and the enterprise and consumers? Has their behavior changed? Uh, of course, uh, we, uh, a big part of, of the, the increase of traffic is coming from uh, uh, home working, uh, so uh, yes, of course, uh, as well as for the residential um, customers, but also for uh, our youngsters uh, who are going to school or university. So uh, we also saw uh, an important increase uh, into the connection of our universities and high schools. Um, and also for the enterprises, because their people are forced to work at home and uh, we believe it will be uh, the new normal that uh, after uh, this pandemic there will be a rebalancing uh, of uh, going to the office uh, or uh, working remotely 
Yes, this is very visible, yes. Basel, it's, it appears that the lines between consumers and enterprises are, are blurring as more people work from home, um, patterns of work behaviour change. Have you learned more about your customers? Have you seen their behaviour changing? Uh, yes, uh, behavior has changed. Uh, previously, we used to have the off peaks and the peaks. Uh, so we used to have the peaks uh, during business hours from the business customers, and then it would die out. And then you had the the, the peaks uh, from residential customers, which would which would die down at 12, 1 a.m. And next, uh, then there would be an ideal time between uh, between two to six or seven in the morning, and then it would start picking up again. Uh, but during the pandemic days, and what we have realized after that is that. Const, uh, the content is pushed throughout the day. Uh, people are having uh, um, like, uh, virtual sessions throughout the day or the night because everyone has to speak to customers in different time zones or in different places of the world. So it really, the, the, there's no peak and off peak now. Uh, the, or I, I would say the peak and off peak has reduced uh, quite a bit. And there's no set boundary or set time where we would say, okay, this is going to be off peak now and the peak is going to start at this time. And Raphael, the industry has been speaking about the need for network agility through increased programmability. Has the pandemic made this a necessity now? What's going to be the next step in this journey? I think it has shown us something that we knew already, but we just realized that it is going to come a little bit earlier. Uh, as we all have been saying for a while now, it is clear that the network is very important. We need to make sure that it is up all the time, that it delivers the capacity and, and the features that are required. Uh, Kurt was mentioning it before. Uh, hospitals are now running on our networks, uh, uh, hospitals that save lives in a, in a pandemic. So we need to be sure that all this is up and running and that all this is uh, configured and set up in the appropriate way. Uh, but at the same time, it is getting more and more complex because we now need to serve all those different uh, uh, enterprises and companies and people from home who, by the way, sometimes are actually companies themselves because they're just the remote location of somebody who, like me, uh, is not uh, working from the office today. Uh, so when you put all that together and you need to ensure these capabilities and, and that flexibility to changes, uh, probably the only way forward is to automate more and more some of the capabilities of managing, configuring, and maintaining that network. And that is probably not something that is going to happen from the morning to the evening. That is probably something that is going to take us in a journey. But what I see a lot of people like Basel and like Kurt and many other companies is they have, they have initiated the journey and uh, they are going into automation to the best of their capabilities and they will do more and more over time because I actually think, uh, I don't know if it was Basel or Kurt who mentioned that this is not, this is not going to come down. Yes, we had a peak in March, but we continue growing the necessities of the networks moving forward. So we cannot anticipate that this is going to go away. We need to go through that automation journey. We need to start it now and, and, and we will need to continue into it. Thank you. And Kurt, do you, do you see the the complexities that Raphael mentioned as basically accelerating the industry's move towards automation and programmability? And if so, what's the next step? How do we actually achieve this? To a certain extent, um, um, our network is already programmable, but uh, with, with these new givens, we know we need to do more. Eh? So we have a challenge ahead. We, we see more and more uh, over the top uh, traffic uh, and it will further increase it, it will double the need of capacity in in the years in front of us so i believe we we need to uh, reflect uh, what we like to automate and um, for the dimension of um, our, uh, our network which is designed for top traffic and for a, a very limited time in in the day I believe we, we need to assess how we can better integrate the optical and the uh, IP network in order to use more efficient all uh, the resources we have in the network. So um, instead of doing huge invest in investments by uh, doing extensions of, of the backbone network uh, almost every week, 
uh, we think we sh I think we should uh, better reflect on how we can better integrate optical and IP layer, but also to automate uh, of or to answer the demand of bandwidth at a given moment in time in an automated way. Basel, has one of the consequences of the pandemic and the, the, the way that enterprises and consumers change their consumption and usage of communication services, has it put increased focus on network agility through increased programmability and automation? Is this now becoming a necessity? And if, if so, how do we actually go about it? What's the next step? So programmability was always an essential part and uh, with the pandemic has really uh, been emphasized on. Uh, but in my, in my point of view, uh, whenever people talked about network pro programmability or talked about uh, programmability in general, it was always looked at from a, from a customer focus or from a capacity point of view. Like we need to, we need to have more liquid, uh, uh, liquid networks. So traffic uh, being offloaded from a link to another link. But with the pandemic, what what has really been and uh, like has been brought out into the light is you really need to look at having uh, automation within your operations of the network. So things like doing software upgrades, because the world like uh, the world didn't stop in a, in, a, in a telecom environment. We still had to do our upgrades. We still had to do uh, vulnerability fixes. We still had to do all those uh, those aspects that come within the network. And the automation really, uh, like uh, I would give you an example. We did some automation with the with Nokia, which reduced our our outage time of our window of our devices being off air from eight hours to 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 two hours uh, for our software upgrades, which was which is which is great you know, because when the devices are back up again, they're making more money for a service provider and they're providing more connectivity to the customer and and the better resiliency and so on and so forth. So really, the emphasis of of uh, programmability rather than just looking at uh, traffic engineering use cases or, or use cases where we can serve the customer faster. We really need to also look at uh, automation and, and, uh, and programmability of doing the, the, the operational use cases, which are quite critical and end up saving um, service providers a lot on the OPEX uh, uh, part of the network. Well, Basil, Kurt and Raphael, thank you all for joining us today and sharing your views. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.